So welcome to the Ultimate Coach Book Reading and Community. And we're so happy to see so many of you here with us. And if you're joining on the Facebook page or on the replay, welcome as well. So before we do anything else, we'd really like to take a moment to make some acknowledgements to Amy Hardison for her commitment, dedication, and the love she put into writing the Book of Being, to Alan D. Thompson for following his inspiration to create and then research the idea of the book, and of course, for the power of his intention to have Steve agree with it. And finally, to, of course, Steve Hardison, the ultimate coach himself, for the impact he's having on all of us, on our way of being and for the impact and service he's been to everybody who crosses his path. Also, thank you to each of you for being here in community today and choosing to dedicate this time to be fully present for yourself. We want you to know how much your presence is valued and that you being here is what makes these readings such a powerful space to be in. Thank you. Today, as we dive deeper into Chapter 2 Roots, we welcome Sundance Robson, who's agreed to read today. Sundance, we feel honoured and excited that you said yes to reading. Thank you. And if you haven't been in Sundance's presence before, you're in for a real treat. And what's more, I can't encourage you enough to seek out his music, and you can find it on Sacred Compass, on Spotify, it will speak to your heart and soul. Sorry, Although Sacred I Compass don't... Journey. Sorry, Sacred, sorry. Sacred Compass Journey. Sacred Compass Journey, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Um, although I don't have a favourite chapter, Chapter 2 Roots has had a massive impact on my own journey to healing my own roots. So I'm so looking forward to discovering more of my own truths here today. Before we begin, we'd like to ask each of you to remain in the integrity of the community and to remember that this is a safe space of sharing about you and the insights you gain from chapter two roots. So we'd like to gently remind you respectfully that this is not a space of self-promotion or promotion of a group or event. Also, while acknowledgements of one another are powerful, we ask that you do not do this here. But if you feel to, that you reach out privately or in the TUC face group. As we begin, we would add a loving reminder that when you read, read about you. And when you listen, listen about you. And when it comes time to share, share about you and your insights into chapter two roots. Thank you once more for being here, for being you and for your contributions to all of our growth. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to the lovely Tanya. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm so excited. Sundance has joined us today to be our very special guest reader. Thank you, Sundance, for saying yes You're welcome. to being with us. Yes. Is there anything you would like to share before we get started? Um, I am the voice and breath of universes. I'm the master of my fate and the captain of my soul, ever tapped into my spirit wealth. I'm that I create myself moment to moment in love. I'm a metaphysician of the new world, innately well, holistic and holy. I'm that Christ consciousness runs like a river through me. I'm the compassionate fire that burns ever higher. I'm that my being does my doing in all moments, every time. I'm that my vision is unlimited possibility. I'm that my past is my past and my future is now. The victim is gone and the spirit has won. I'm a gift born of astrological beauty for this moment in time. I'm that I take all things into consideration for the outcome that serves most powerfully. I'm peace embodied and it is felt in our home. I'm the voice of the wild dancing with the prayers of my ancestors. 
I am the smoke as it rises in ceremony with the sacred sound of transformation that arises from being. I'm the loving silence that heals a nation. I'm the real blood of the indigenous and it runs through my veins. I'm the transforming power of the instantaneous. And now I'm the manifestation of my ancestors standing holy and healed. I'm that I deeply honor and value the unlimited resources of skilled communication that are my nature. I'm that my words make up my inner world. I am divine intuition and my sacred compass always points me home. I'm never without because I am always within. I am beautifully gorgeous, fit, and lean. I'm the living nature of sacred masculinity. I'm that my love to Care Marie exists beyond the words, passionately eternal, ever loving, beautiful, and fun. I'm that my love is service and my service is love. This is who I am, and this is who I create myself to be. And my mother and father named me Sundance. Thank you, Sundance, for sharing who you are in this world. Thank you. At this time, I would love to know who has their ultimate coach book with them today. Would you like to hold it up? Who has their book today? Who would like to read the back of the book? How about Steve Shaw? Steve, would you like to read the back of the book today? You. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Ah, you had that feeling, huh? Okay. And Sherry, would you like to read the first two pages before you begin by Steve Hardison? And oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, would you like to? Sure. I wasn't prepared for that, but okay. Okay, so the way that we're going to do it is we're, what, what we'll do is crazy. we will um, we'll have Steve Shaw read the back of the book, and yeah. then we will, as soon as Steve is finished reading the back of the book, we'll go straight into you oh. reading the first two pages of the yeah. book, and then we'll flow right into oh. Sundance reading the chapter, chapter two. And what I would like to ask everyone is that as you are listening to the questions that are being read in the back of the book and before you begin, if you will please, um, or if you will, if one particular question stands out to you and you would like to focus on that particular question for the reading, sometimes when we go into a reading with intention, we can really um, have even greater breakthroughs. So if you would like to share what that question is, in the chat, we would love to hear, or we'd love to see. Um, so at this time, I'd love to invite Steve, we'll go ahead and get started to read the back of the book. And then Sherry will go straight to you. And then Sundance. All right, Steve Shaw. Please Sorry, I was, you. yep, I got it. Awesome. Dear potential reader, as you may have noticed, there are no testimonials on the back cover of this book imploring you to read it. I veto that. The only testimonial I am interested in is the one you will have from reading and experiencing this book. Please do not read this book about me. Read this book about you. Read it about being. As you read, ask yourself, who would I need to be to be a more loving person? Who would I need to be to be a more effective parent? Who would I need to be to create a level of confidence that is remarkable? Who would I need to be to be at peace with who I am? Who would I need to be to be fully in love with myself and my life? Who would I need to be to live the most extraordinary life I can live? I promise you that if you read this book with the intention of expanding your state of being, you will do exactly that your experience will be remarkable. Who you are being is everything. Loving you, be blessed, be you, Steve Hardison. Before you begin by Steve Hardison. Note, thank you for reading the back cover and the first two pages each time you read this book. 
I never wanted to write a book and I haven't. I never wanted to have a book written about me, but here it is. This book is a gift from my wife, Amy, who wrote it, and my friend, Alan D. Thompson, who conducted the research and interviews on which it is based. And it's not just a gift to me, but to you too. And now you're reading it. So with your permission, I'll give you some suggestions on how to read it. You see, this isn't an ordinary book. It's not a simple biography. It's not a self-help book. It's not a literary classic. It's definitely not a book about how to coach. In fact, it's not a book about doing anything. It's a book about being. And it's a book about you. To access this book, ask yourself these questions as you read. Who am I being as a partner, a parent, or friend? Who am I being as a leader? Who am I being a member of my community? Who would I need to be to have miracles show up in my daily life? Who would I need to be to create value in the work that I do? Who would I need to be to generate a life of abundance? Who would I need to be to alter my relationship with fear? Who would I need to be to be at peace with my past? Who would I need to be to be step powerfully into my future? Who would I need to be to be present as a way of being? Who would I need to be to live the most extraordinary life I can live? Who would I need to be to know that my life makes a difference? Who would I need to be to be fully in love with myself and my life? Who would I need to be in order to improve my relationships with the most important people in my life? Who would I need to be to read The Ultimate Coach and have a personal breakthrough in being the wonderful me? The best part about this book, this book about you, is that it is endless. The story goes on and it's written by your being. Loving you, be blessed, be you, Steve Hardison. Part one, the life. Chapter two, roots. Two handsome airmen stood on the side of the road with their thumbs in the air. It was 1944, the war still raged. Maureen and her girlfriend were driving by Hill Air Force Base when they spotted the airmen. Should they stop? Why not? It was a split second decision that lasted a lifetime. Maureen Forbes was a Mormon girl. From the um, yes, Daniel. Would I be able to just get you to mute your um, mic, Sherry? Uh, Maureen Forbes was a Mormon girl from the small town of Clearfield, 25 miles north of Salt Lake City. She had green eyes and auburn hair. She was a vivacious and intelligent valedictorian of the class of 1944 at Davis High. She played the organ, the violin, and the piano. She adored jewelry and had a flair for passion. She also had a little bit of attitude and just the right amount of kick ass. Roy Hardison was a paratrooper in the Air Force. He was a handsome, slender, and tall, just over 6'4". He was raised in Kentucky by, God, by God-fearing parents who walked several miles each Sunday to the local Baptist church. As sharecroppers, they lived a hard scabble life, made harder by not knowing how to read or write. On payday, others helped them cash their paychecks skimming the top off a check that barely covered necessities. Roy did everything possible to erase all traces of his humble origins from his life. His shoes were polished, his fingernails manicured. He was impeccably dressed. He was rough around the edges, but that was hardly noticeable when he cut such a striking figure. 
And it wasn't just his appearance, he had charm. <clears throat> Later, Maureen would frequently say he could talk the birds out of the trees. Maureen was smitten. At 18, Maureen still had to be home at 10 every night. Rory was adventurous and exciting, the opposite of Maureen's tamped down life. They eloped on June 9th, 1945, not ready to tell her parents. Maureen returned home as if nothing had changed. When her parents found out that Miss Maureen was Mrs. Hardison, they sent her to her husband. She had made her bed. She would lie in it. <laughs> Children. It wasn't long before Maureen was expecting a two-for-one pregnancy. Unfortunately, her twins came too early. She delivered them into her bathroom, attended by her mother and a local doctor. Sammy and Danny didn't live long. The doctor dropped them in a bucket. Marine's soul shuddered. By the next year, a healthy and robust baby boy, Rob, joined the family. He was followed by sisters, Jamie and Teresa. In 1953, Roy was deployed to Bitburg, a small town in Germany. Phil was born in June, 1954. 13 months later, Steve was born at the military hospital in Bitburg. He weighed 11.5 pounds, 5.2 kilograms, and was the biggest baby born in that hospital as of 1955. A year later, the family was in Mountain Home, Idaho, and the year after that, Roy was deployed to Spain. Maureen and Roy's marriage was difficult. They both had strong personalities. Roy was fond of playing poker and played often with the officers from the Air Force Base. His losses strained the family finances and he was a bit of a libertine. In the 1950s, it was routine and reasonable for Americans living abroad to employ household help. One morning when living in Germany, Maureen walked into the kitchen and said good morning to the maid. The maid spat in her face. Why this sudden contempt? It seems Roy had forced himself on the maid. In Spain, Roy and Maureen went out to eat with another couple, who we will call John and Mary. During dinner, Roy announced that he and Mary were in love. They were leaving their marriages and going off together. While Maureen grappled with this portrayal, Mary said, I've changed my mind. I'm staying with John. Roy turned to Maureen and said, well, I guess I'll stay with you. Maureen longed to divorce Roy, but with five young children and no college education, her operations were limited. She stayed in the marriage. Her options were limited. She stayed in the marriage. Throughout his adult life, Roy was good at making money, but he was better at spending it. He frequently picked up the tab for steak dinners and rounds of drinks, propping up his image as a high roller with deep pockets. At home, Maureen barely had enough money to put food on the table. Roy's excessive spending and gambling debts caught up with him when they were living in Seville, Spain. He resorted to writing bad checks 16 of them for a total of $810, worth about $8,000 today. He faced a military investigation to avoid the possibility of a dishonorable discharge. Roy resigned from the Air Force. The family returned to the States and moved to Indiana, where they lived in East Gary, Hammond, and Griffith. One of Steve's earliest memories occurred at this time. He was young, still waddling in diapers. He was outside on the front porch. It was snowing. He couldn't get into the house. His diaper was soiled. No one was there to help him. They should be there to help him. He felt abandoned. This was not the most traumatic abandonment Steve would experience, but it was the first. It etched into his soul. Civilian life wasn't going well. Home life became violent, loud, explosive, uncertain, and stressful, especially when Roy had been drinking and he drank a lot. Steve remembers a family dinner abruptly ending when his dad launched a bowl of mashed potatoes, 
across the room, potatoes flying everywhere. If Rory wasn't drinking, he could be fun. Jamie remembers playing kick the can with them. He liked practical jokes. However, his play edged cruel to cruel. He short sheeted his kids' beds, crumbled up corp flakes, and put them on their sheets and put Tabasco sauce inside of Oreos. Rob, Steve's older brother, learned never to take anything his father offered him. Roy taught Rob to play baseball by throwing baseballs as hard as he could at Rob. He taught Rob to swim by throwing him into a river in Germany and then walking away. Nothing Rob did was ever good enough for Roy. If Roy raised his hand quickly, Rob ducked. By the time Rob was 14, he had peptic ulcers. Roy was gentler with his girls. He dotted on Teresa. Phil and Steve were too young to pay attention to. The most traumatic event of Steve's young life occurred late one night when Roy, under the influence, was beating Maureen. All five kids were in the house, lying petrified in their beds. When Maureen screamed for Rob to help her, Roy threatened, if you get out of bed, I'll kill you. They all took him at his word. No one moved. Clearfield. Several states away, Ellen Forbes fretted. Her daughter was in trouble. She was sure of it. Ellen and John, J.P. Maureen's parents, asked their son, Myron, to go to Indiana and assess Maureen's situation. Despite a debilitating fear of flying, Myron braved the three-hour flight. When he got to Maureen's house, the kids were home alone. Maureen was working at a bar, and Roy had been missing for several days, presumably on one of his benders. Myron reported back to Ellen. Ellen and JP scrapped, scraped together the money for, a six, for six train tickets to, or, to Orden, for, to Org then. Maureen and the kids fled before Roy returned. Ellen and JP were almost finished building a house next to their current one when Maureen and the kids arrived. Ellen and JP moved into the new house and gave Maureen their old one instead of spelling, instead of selling or renting it. Maureen had come for a full circle. She was back home under the watchful eyes of her parents in the small town where she had grown up. It was a relief. However, she didn't return to the religion of her youth, keeping her slightly out of step with the Mormon community. <clears throat> Ellen and JP were 68 and 73, respectively. When Maureen moved in next door at an age when others might be retiring, Ellen and JP were still running their small farm, 11 acres just west of the railroad tracks. They had chickens, cows, and a small orchard with apple, apricot, and cherry trees. They grew beets, green beans, tomatoes, wheat, and hay. Their primary income source was from the milk their cows produced, but they also sold some of their produce. They didn't have the time or the energy to raise a second family, but they were there for emergencies. Marine started waitressing full-time and going to school. She was proud and independent. She did everything she could to make it on her own without church or government assistance. She didn't quite pull it off. They had an industrial sized peanut butter. They had industrial sized peanut butter from the church's welfare center in their pantry and milk from JP's cows. Steve hated that milk. Steve hated that the milk often had cow hair floating in it, but the milk and the peanut butter were enough to keep hunger at bay. Still, Steve hoped his friends would invite him home after school so he could get a snack and on a really good day, an invitation to dinner. Work in school pulled Maureen, Maureen out of the home for most of her child's waking hours. Jamie says there were long periods of time when they never saw their mom except when she came home to sleep. Rob and Jamie were in charge of the younger siblings, but they were going to school and working at local restaurants. Rob worked as a busboy at the officer's club at Hill, 
Air Force Base from 6 p.m. to midnight and then tried to stay awake at high school the next day, often unsuccessfully. Minimal supervision had its perks. Steve explored the farms, the culverts, and the town. No one was restraining his curiosity or his propensity for mischief. No adult was hovering. No parent was pushing compliance. He had ample space to be himself, but there were definite downsides. There were few family dinners and no family vacations. As far as Steve was concerned, they were a group of lone wolves living in the same house. Steve's dominant memory of his childhood is being alone. He came home from school to an empty house. When he played sports, no one was there to cheer him on. If he was sick, he was home alone. Once he had an adverse reaction to medication and suffered hallucinations, he had to sort out reality from terror by himself. Often, Steve had to figure out his homework by himself. He had questions about life, his body, and his future. Usually, there was no one around to ask. The worst time to be alone was night. Sometimes he called Grandma Ellen and asked if he could come over. She normally said yes, but Steve was terrified of the dark, a fear that lasted until he was 15. To get to Grandma Ellen's, Steve had to cross the sector of terror between his back porch and his grandmother's back door. It wasn't far, but it felt like three miles. Steve's fears weren't groundless. Sketchy looking men frequently walked by Steve's house after working at the nearby Job Corp, a job training pro program for at-risk young adults. One night, an intruder entered their home through Steve's window. Steve feigned sleep while the man hovered over him. The intruder's attention, whatever they were, were derailed when Marine shrieked, Rob, get your gun. Someone's in the house. Her bluff worked. The prowler bolted out of the window. Steve was not the only one afraid of the Hardison, house, of the Hardison household. From time to time, Roy called Maureen and threatened to come to Utah and take the kids. Because of this, Maureen never insisted on child support. She never received $1 from Roy to provide for his children. It was worth it to keep him away. Once Roy did show up, Steve was young, about five. He remembers his dad putting him up on the back porch. Steve pointed to the mountains and said he would like to go there. Roy said he would take him. Steve never saw his father again. These experiences left their mark on Steve. Er in his life, but he also lost his mother. Her heart was with her family, but her time and energy were committed to temporal survival. Deep down, Steve knew that when you are five years old, adults should be there to help you. He also knew that when a dad says he will take you to the mountains, he should do it. How disappointing, how infuriating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sundance, for reading that chapter so beautifully for us. At this time, go ahead and take a break for a minute. We're going to go back to our first reader, and then I'll invite you to share afterwards. Um, so, Steve, I would like to come to you, Mr. Steve Shaw. Is there something present with for you that you would like to share with us today? Um, yeah, actually, um, uh, you know, in chapter two, hold on a second here. Um, the, the idea of, um, you know, not kind of feeling a, a sense of being alone, right? And being a lone wolf and, and being out there, that's, uh, that resonates. Um, you know, with with me really, uh, you know, really deeply, uh, and it's what got me into the book. The idea that when he was left out on the porch, and you know, something similar like that, 
for me it was when I fell out of a second floor window when I was, I don't know, maybe three years old, two or three years old. I was, you know, um, wandering around and my mom finally had to find me. So uh, I, I get how one incidence can, and so that, that, that was, um, you know, the, you know, the idea of, of trying to find your way home. That was always been my, my um, sort of my guiding thing. So this has uh, been really, uh, it was, this is this is a good chapter for me because uh, that kind of, oh, I got to, I really got to read this book because of that. So that's what I have. I'm complete. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for sharing with, with us today from your heart. Sherry, I would like to invite you. Is there something present that you would like to share with us today? One second. I need to find the quiet. <laughs> um, I was struck with the... For me, it, it felt, um, I, let's see, let's start over. I resonated with how the chaos and noise of his childhood ended up for him, for Steve, ended up uh, as he grew up and as he got older, made him turn into such a calm, and caring and quiet presence for others. And, and I feel like that's kind of the thing that I strive for. I didn't have the struggles like he did, uh, but just turning the chaos into a calming presence. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And thank you for reading for us today as well. Thank you, Steve, also for opening us up and reading the back of the book. And at this time, I'd love to invite Sundance. Sundance, is there something present with you today from reading this chapter, chapter two, Roots? Um, it was so interesting. Uh, when you requested that I read this chapter, I was like, the first time I read the book, um, I saw that Steve didn't have an easy childhood. And um, I, I think that for myself in the life that I had, living a fairly marginalized life, <clears throat> when I came across Steve Hardison's work, I was, I think, naturally just judgmental towards Steve and was like, well, I mean, in his world, it's, yeah, I think that's all possible. And so, but what about my world? And so when I read chapter two, The Roots, it was it was very um, grounding because the the piece on, like his, his father, um, I remember reading posts that Steve wrote about thanking his father for him to now see what he didn't want to actually become. And um, the way that his father treated his mom was very much, it, it sort of mirrored um, the relationship with my parents, especially this piece about the potatoes. Um, there was there was a time when uh, my parents were in this some argument. My brother was crying, and and my dad was holding the sandwich, and he just he just you know yelled and said, "I'm I'm trying to f and eat," and he threw the sandwich like right at her head, right. And I remember just that moment and thinking it was just so. Um, it was so intense and, and I couldn't understand that as a little kid because I'd never ex really experienced it before. So I, I didn't really naturally know how to process it. I just didn't understand why that was happening. And, and sort of this, and also this, I remember this time when my dad, we were driving on the highway and he pointed, he pointed to the amusement park that was on the side of the highway. And he told me, I'm going to take you there. The next time that I have 
that I have you visiting with you. I'm going to take you guys there to that amusement park. And he never did. And I never, I remember shortly after that, he moved to Vancouver and I never really saw him again after that. And so the part where he's also standing on the, on the deck, looking at the back mountains and his father says, he's going to take him there. I really, that really spoke to me because I was like, I saw in my life where that led to me not trusting people's words. And then also in, in, in fact, me not living up to my own and thinking that I can, I can be passive around my word, you know? And so um, the roots is like such a, it's such an appropriate word for this chapter roots, because it really speaks to where um, life grounds into and, 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 and the work that displays itself in this book over the next, over the whole rest of the book, all the way through into the vignettes, you can see <clears throat> how this book of being really is about us. It's a gift it was a gift to Steve, but it's also a gift to us. And that if we read it with the intention of extending or of having a breakthrough in our state of being, expanding our state of being, that that'll actually happen. Um, because all of this work really tends to, it gives us an opportunity to do our own, you know, and it, it's all here. Like, you know, even with the document, the reason that I started off with my document was because that's who I am. And for anybody that doesn't know me, I wanted to introduce myself appropriately. So, um, and it's, from what I understand, it's meant to be shared publicly. So, um, and to be shared with the world, it's a gift. So give it away. So, you know, there's, that's just a few things I could probably take up the next uh, hour. But those are really some some key parts that spoke to me. And, and that chapter really speaks to my soul. And, and I acknowledge you, Tanya, for asking me to to, to, to read. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for sharing so vulnerably from your heart and again for saying yes to being here and for your continual growth that you step into every day of your life to recreate who you are here and now, um, irregardless of your past and, and the roots that originally um, created your experience as a child. So thank you. At this time, I would like to open it up to the community to share. And as a kind reminder, I would really like us to all be present to how this particular chapter, chapter two, Roots, has created insights and possibly breakthroughs in your own life. So our first, I see David. David, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, it's always interesting meeting somebody else's um, dysfunctional childhood. Um, <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is a theft of joy. And it's so easy to say, well, mine was worse. Than, oh, his was worse. than mine. It doesn't matter. We all had, in a varying degrees, dysfunctional families. Those of us who had them, some of them, I have friends who didn't. Um, and um, my father passed away two years ago last week, and my mother went downhill after that and is now in a memory care unit down in Florida where my brother is. Um, and I was able to forgive my mother about 25 years ago, point where I'm at peace with, with her, and I can say that I love her, and I can let that part go. And I also know that Steve didn't get where he is because of this. He got where he is in spite of this. A lot of work that he had that he had to do to get where he to get to become who he is now, as I have as well. Um, it's it's it's. it's I can't say it's comforting to know, oh, yeah, he had something like this happen, too. Um, but it's a reminder that regardless of, of the circumstance, we can become who we are now and do the work and, and get here. And I was 
this is the hardest chapter for me to read because I empathize. His family was different than mine. He grew up in place he had different things his father was different than mine my father my mother was different from his um it's and still the bond of early life that we that many of us not all of us obviously i'm just speaking for myself what i had to come through to get to where i am um in one way i see it as in a, in a lot of ways, I see it. In most ways, I see it as an accomplishment. Um, I still, my inner child still feels a little bit like, yeah, you know, that happened like that. But at the same time, um, I'm gratified that in spite of all of that, I am where I am today. And Theodore Roosevelt was right. It doesn't matter. Is childhood worse than mine? Was my childhood worse than his? It doesn't matter. We all had what we had, and we took what we had, and we got to where we are today. And we are being, and as I mentioned last time, still becoming more. And we still have the ability to be more than who we are, even if we're pretty darn good where we are now. So, um, Thank you, David. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Mr. Dave Orton, I see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Would you like to share? I would. Um, I love what David said. Um, you know, I had, I grew up in a family that was much more like Amy's family. Um, I grew up in a in a town that had a higher concentration of Mormons than Clearfield, if you can believe it, in in uh, eastern Idaho. And my parents uh, loved us and took care of us, and they're still together. And my daughter works for them <laughs> while she's going to university in the town where I grew up. And yet, somehow, I still managed to make to to create the injuries that um that i felt like made me the way that i was and gave me the the victimhood that i created in my own mind or in my own experiences you know um my mother i didn't know this until i was like in my mid-30s she had chronic pain and so it always seemed like we would make plans for months and then the day of the plans if mom wasn't feeling good the plans just got dropped, um, never to be visited again. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, I, I guess the 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 thing is, is that even if you have the quote unquote perfect childhood, it doesn't feel perfect. It feels like there's always some problem that you get to bump up against that I got to bump up against to to create the the reasons for why it was okay for me to not um, to to not succeed or to allow myself to experience failure or to to feel bad or to judge myself, my parents, my community, I think. Um, so even if you had it really, really good, uh, and most of us didn't, I, I'm clear on that. Um, I was one of the lucky ones, quote unquote. The, as far as I can tell, the most important thing we can do is to is to feel love for ourselves, to experience the miracle of self-love, self-forgiveness. With that, I uh, am out of here. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for sharing from your heart as well. I see Steve Shaw's hand up one more time and I would love Steve if you would hold on just one second I would like to invite Teresa hold away I know she has to leave the call early Teresa would you like to share with us sure today? sure um build a little bit on what Dave said um and also what well what both Dave said so for me 
And growing up in the same household, I realized that my story is different than my brother's story. And that's the way it is for a lot of families. And one of the, uh, a couple of things that came to me when, the, as, as Sundance was reading this is, Stephen would be too young to understand things like, our mother didn't take us to church because she was always working. It wasn't that she didn't embrace her, her faith. It's that she was taking care of our physical needs. So our grandparents were there and we went to church with them. So some of those things may be a different experience for him than they were for my understanding why that was there. Um, sometimes I don't think it's clear. My father was an alcoholic. So you have the dynamic that comes from um, abuse of a substance in a household. So a lot of that was in his personality. Uh, some of the things that Stephen was maybe too young to recognize was times that my father was very loving with my mother on occasions. Uh, you have the same dysfunction that you have when somebody has an addiction in a household. Um, a lot of those times, it was very difficult, uh, the, the disruptive times and the absence of my father being there and the struggle, seeing my mother uh, trying to keep things together. But I, I made a note at the end of this chapter, um, and I'll just read it to you because it's what stands out to me the most. Um, Stephen had an, an aloneness that he captured. I could see the struggles my mother was having, and so I my my aim was to try to help her. Um, so as a, a young woman, I, I learned how to clean a house. Uh, and in this chapter, it kind of gives, and I'll just clarify it for the sake of my wanting to clarify it, that Rob and Jamie weren't there with my younger brothers. I was there with my younger brothers because, you see, they were working. And so that was a part of, I learned later, why I have become so accommodating and empathetic was out of that household, of seeing the need my mother had, how she was struggling. Uh, also, to see that my younger brothers needed somebody to call them to attention, which they didn't do it anyway, but you, you were there if you if they wanted to. So we're all in this, we all may have experiences, uh, but we all incorporate them differently into our lives. Mine might have been to become a helper, to become accommodating, uh, to see the needs of other people. Stevens went into a loneliness and uh, I never realized that. Uh, as a sibling looking at him, I would never have thought that he had the feelings that he did. I don't discount them now because they seem like they're very real and I have a better understanding of them. But I was not cognizant of the time. We were just kids. We were just growing up. So you don't really know that. So the, what I take from this chapter uh, for, my, with, for myself, this is my observation, is Steve's stories about being hungry uh, have always stood out to me. There was always food to eat. Often it had to be prepared, but it was always available. Uh, and a part of that, and especially reading this book again, that sticks out to me about Steve's hunger is his hunger for the absence of our father, the absence of our mother due to what it took to keep us together and the hunger for a traditional family. So I better understand from reading this, his story of hunger because I was never hungry but hunger has many different faces. Uh, and so that's that's the part that I would leave with you. Thank you for asking me, Tanya, I appreciate that. You're, you're muted, Tanya. Thank you so much, Thank Teresa. Great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your all of your um, support and presence in supporting the creations of the book readings. Uh, your presence is valued immensely thank you for who you be you bet um i this this growth is for me as well so I, and i love that i have been able to create a place to support my brother so it's it's meaningful it's meaningful for me it's purposeful for me as well so thank you very much well thank you your commitment in supporting your brother and supporting the book readings and sharing the love and the possibility of breakthrough throughout the world is um, greatly valued. So thank you. Thank you. Steve Shaw, I see your hand. Would you like? 
Yeah, um, actually, I just had a question of Sundance when he said something about um, your passive word or your word was passive. Uh, and that, it kind of struck me. What, and, and, and maybe I should wait till the end or anything like that. I just wanted to ask him about that because that just, what, what was, what he, what he meant by a passive word. I'm free to answer that. Um, so giving my word to things and then that time expiring and not even acknowledging the fact that the time has expired and addressing it, that I've given my word to something and like, where, where did I go in the word, right? And, and there's someone else on the other side of that. There's someone that was counting on me. Yeah. Someone that said, hey, Sundance is going to do this today. And then there's just nothing. And that was, for me, it was that was very passive because like my life, um, my former life as an, a drug addict, that was, it was impossible for me to plan life. It was impossible for me to commit to family events two weeks down the road because I didn't know if I was going to be coming down. Chances are it would be pretty good that I would be coming down, but if I was, because I'd try to get myself in shape to be around my family, but I would say I'd be there. Yes, Sundance will be here. Gotcha. And just gone. <laughs> where, where, is, where is Sundance exactly? You know, so I was very passive. I would, I would find whatever it would be, which would probably be a substance to pacify myself. And that would carry off into people's lives. Hey, thank you. Thank you for sharing Sundance. Such a powerful awareness that this has created in many of our lives in recognizing exactly that is where we have stories from our roots and how they have impacted us and where we are actually have been conditioned by them. And that is or has been a way of being that we mimic as well. And so I think that this book has does such a beautiful job when we're opening it up to ourselves and being present with ourselves of where those particular behaviors are also being carried out by us, but that's not really our intention. And that kind of opens, opens it up for us. Okay. Well then who do we want to be, or how do we want to be here? And I love that you shared that so vulnerably Sundance um, and how that created awareness to you of being your word and what being your word looks like and what commitment or integrity to your word looks like now. Like the past, you can't go back, but now. And so I, I feel so grateful for you, your share today. Thank you. Lorraine, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Whew. Um. So my mother recently passed away. So the tears are good. That's also how spirit shows up. Spirit is love for me right now. And um, so the whole chapter, there's so much identification. And I see myself and my family in the whole chapter. So to pick one thing uh, that's kind of a, cord that I've been working on since I first read um, the book last year it because I didn't know I'd be going through my mom's year of decline and uh, it was fast um, yet the grace was I got eight months to take you know pretty messed up um, childhood, we've gone through completion and forgiveness and reconciliation and lots of um, healing and miracles have been in our past. But um, when I make myself surrendering to that love to take care of her in a new way, because as you said, you can't change the past, but we can change today. And I had a lot of awakenings and a lot of todays to heal and to bring healing to my mom and to bring pure love and kindness 
and joy and acceptance in ways that I wasn't able to do before this year. And um, now I'm in the chapter of going through all of her materials and learning this chapter really inspired me to embrace my roots and embrace my ancestry and um, to be whole and complete about who my ancestors were and, and were being and the struggles that they went through and how they overcame them. And it led me to seeing that my mom, her uh, biological parents, their parents both immigrated from Denmark. And so I can embrace what that life must have been like to immigrate to a new country and a new culture and the struggles that they went through and a lot of death, early age death. And so that led me to this sense of when I have this sense that I've been working on since I started reading this book about not being good enough as an identity that's a lie but it runs deep. And so I could see the connection, not just to my parents. My father was a alcoholic and bipolar. So I, and he died early in my life. And then um, for my mom, she was always striving to kind of absorb what was happening with my dad. And yet as a child, we don't get that. And so I could really see in my mom that that wounding that happened to her and just embrace her and just love her and cherish her. And um, so that I can, yes, grieve because I miss her. I miss being with her. And I miss her being this, even though it had all that wounding still coloring who she was able to be in this last year. And yet I know on the other side, you know, today I'm crying and that's okay because I can put on the cover of, I'm great, I'm full and complete, I'm done with grieving. I want to be done and move on with my life. And that was a big draw to be here today is to be with my grief. And I wouldn't be grieving if I wasn't full of love for her. So that's where I am today. And I'm whole and complete with the tears. I'm whole and complete with my um, ancestry. I'm really proud to be multiple generations forward. I get to cut the cord on a lot of those wounds that my mom didn't get to do. And I did go through an inner healing with my spiritual mentor. Um, in April, so that I could cut the cord on her behalf while she was still alive, and on my family's behalf, because it runs deep with my sister as well. So thank you for inviting me. I so honor everyone who is here and always sharing. I haven't had time to really pop in as much this year, because I was either in a car or in the nursing home or hospital most of my time, but I would treasure just dropping in and seeing all the wonderful wisdom that this group pours in. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your tender share. I'm sending you lots of love and I love what you said through my tears. I am still whole and complete and that you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your and being allowing us to witness that even through tears, even through sorrows, we can still be whole and complete. So thank you. Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Thank you so much for raising your hand. Thank you for for asking to speak. I'm so sorry for your loss, Lorraine. Sending you so much love. Um, this chapter is incredibly powerful for me. I mean, the first time that I read it, I, I, as David said, I think, you know, many of us have had dysfunctional childhoods and they're neither worse or better one than the other. They're just dysfunctional as a child. You go through that 
and you, you're traumatized by it. So it's no, no more or less than anyone else's. Um, when I first read the chapter, a lot of it resounded with me. My mum was an alcoholic. My dad was in the Navy, so he was away a lot. And he took his life when I was 20. So I had a certain story about my parents that was that five-year-old, that 10-year-old, that 15-year-old, that 20-year-old story that lived with me and I guess formed who I was for many, many years. And so when I read the chapter the first time, I saw those similarities and was like, oh yeah, I understand that. When I read it again, it broke me apart because I realized the stories I had of my parents were the stories of my five-year-old. And that when I actually looked beyond those stories, I saw how my mum had got to where she was and how my dad had got to where he was. And it changed the story that I had of them. It made me understand where they'd come from and where they finished. Um, so I had a much better understanding of them, but a lot more compassion for them. Although I'd done the forgiving, I had much more compassion for them. Like Teresa, I then spoke with my brother and realized that his story was completely different to mine, that we had lived two completely different childhoods. So I realized that the stories I was telling myself were just stories and nothing else. They, they were a reality created by a five-year-old, a 10-year-old to, to protect themselves, but not really the reality of who my parents were. And when they died, the stories other people told me of them were completely different. My question this time was, who would I need to be to be at peace with who I am? And I really didn't expect to get an answer. And the answer that I got was simply, as we all are told so often in the group, just change the story. I'm just telling myself a story about myself and I can very easily change the story about my parents. And so I can just as easily change the story about myself. So for me, this chapter is incredibly, incredibly powerful and I'm complete. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else that would like to share with us today? I would like to read something from a beautiful book that I have here, and it says, Vital Roots. Like tall buildings, trees need solid foundations to keep them in place. They also need to collect water and nutrients from the soil. Both these tasks are carried out by roots, which fan out through the ground. Roots grow in step with the rest of the tree. At first, they are small, delicate, and very easy to break. But by the time a tree reaches maturity, its biggest roots are as strong as a ship's cables, helping it to ride out storms. Laid end to end, a tree's entire root system may be thousands of miles long. The underground roots, hidden away beneath the soil's surface, tree roots make up a secret world with its own wildlife. Some of the animals stay below the ground and never see daylight in their lives. Others, including many insects, grow up inside rotting wood or shuttle between the surface and the soil. These mini animals help to break down dead remains, recycling nutrients that trees need to grow. And I love that because for me, it really brought up, again, some of the roots that are from my past that felt like animals eating me up inside. And until I recognized that it actually could be as a possibility there to grow me in a different sense, but I was holding on to the negative aspects of it. And coincidentally, divine alignment last season in season three, when we were approaching the chapter on roots across the street from me, 36 acres were cleared. And I got to see a lot of roots that 
they pulled up from the ground. Like it was just these giant piles of roots that I could see. And so they, they carried off these roots and they pulled they, all these, these trees out. But what I got to see in just a little bit more time was things growing again from those same spaces that they pulled the roots. So there was a deeper root system in there and they actually cleared the space for a new development to build something on top of it. And I thought to myself, wow, all of the people that possibly will move into this space will never know what was there before, but I do because I got to witness it. And so I really got to understand that although there is a clean slate from what is visible to, to, to new, there is something still growing beneath and that it was up to me on if there was a root that wasn't fully serving me, did I need to go in and yank it from the bottom or could I also create awareness that it was there to create something new within me if I had a new perspective on it that I could actually create something new from that and in that it would really became powerful in me of what am I creating that's not new in my relationship with my husband what am I creating that's not new with my children by me being so busy sometimes and that I was creating the roots for my children and was I in alignment with how I wanted to create their experience and it took a really really hard experience for me to understand and for me to listen at such a deeper level to listen to my children when they were silently crying out for support and to help for help was I being reactive that no it's not that way you're just seeing it from a from your perspective and it's not actually that way but yet I had my own perspective of my own childhood and so it was with it is with this awareness that I can recreate I can recreate right now and I can recreate their experience as well right now by who I choose to be. I don't have to go off of just one bad experience that that will be their experience for the rest of their life. And so I feel like where this book book has really opened me up is just who do I want to be now to be a more effective parent as the root for my children's life and choose now. Because at some points in my life and through their experience, I wasn't present but I can change that now. We can all change that now. We have now. So thank you. Thank you for letting me share. Daniel, Daniel, I see your hand. Would you like to share? Yeah, thank you. Well, it was what, it was what you said, Tanya, that sparked something for me. I, uh, I resonate a lot with the chapter and a lot of my childhood, I was um, alone, alcoholic father, mother who was, uh, looks like you're done talking. So we'll lower your, oh, thank you. Um, and so, but what's interesting for, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've often felt really grateful for my childhood because it sparked me to learn and learn a different way of being and, and, you know, as, as Lorraine was talking about her creating a different understanding for her parents and different story. Like I did a lot to look back and see, okay, well, why did my parents become who they were? And nonetheless, when, um, when Sundance was reading today, I, I felt like this big well of sadness in me. And it's like, I feel like I've, I've, I've healed a lot of what my childhood was and yet I can still feel the the sadness or, you know, that moment where Steve knew somehow deep down that, yeah, adults are supposed to be there for you when you're five years old and you shit yourself or whatever it is. Um, what what struck me, though, in what you were saying, Tanya, is like I can see my, my parents and, and their parents and, you know, actually back a few generations of 
how much they longed to put down roots, but just didn't somehow have the the education or the knowledge of how to do it. Like, you know, I, I can feel my father wanted roots to go down, but he didn't know how to do it. He, you know, he used substance instead um, to not not take care of that, not heal himself. And and my mother had her own stories about why she was not able to heal herself. And part of what I'm grateful for is, well, we have um, a different opportunity. I have a different opportunity at this point in my life. I'm, I'm exposed to different information, the book, this community, you know, for, for many years, uh, the knowledge um, of how to heal. And I think of the, the metaphor I heard JP use about the document and how it's like a, a redwood root system and redwood being these huge trees that don't have roots that support it. But when they inter, intertwine with each other and the different statements and uh, different components of who we choose to be, who we make ourselves to be, when they intermingle, they create a support for who we can be. So the way I reflect on this is there's there's still the sadness for me of um, what could have been for my parents and, and a childhood that would have been different. At the same time, I'm really grateful for it and grateful for the opportunities that I have now to create myself into someone different. Um, and after many, many, many years of self-development, personal and spiritual development to be at this stage where I'm coming into this consciousness that's carried by uh, Steve and, and the book and this community. Uh, I'm, I feel grateful for uh, sort of another level or another stability of a new root structure. So enough said from me. Thank you. Tanya, you're muted. No. David, would you like to share? Yeah, um, I'm just struck by that. When when you read that uh, piece about the roots, um, as Daniel said, with the redwoods, they connect together to hold them upright. There's the old saying, it takes a village. It takes a forest to raise a tree. We look at each tree and we think of it as an individual tree with individual roots, um, which actually, as you know, can, um, communicate with the other trees. If there is a, a parasite coming through, they let the other trees know so that they can send out some pheromones or some things to, to, to um, bring in some other insects that will eat the parasite. They will communicate from one end of the of the forest to the other because they're all interconnected. We look at a tree. Okay, there's a tree has lots of roots. It goes underground, but they're all connected as a forest, and we don't always see the forest for the trees, as to, to use a trite metaphor cliche. Um, but a tr a tree on one end of the forest could be communicating miles away to trees on another end of the forest, send out some pheromones, get those insects in here who will eat those parasites and save us all. And they will do that because we're, everything is connected underground. And when we see an individual tree just as an individual tree and chop it down and do something or whatever, forest it or whatever, we destroy part of an integrity of an entire community. Um, and we don't always see that tree as part of a community, and we don't always see, I don't always see myself as part of a community. I don't, you know, I am an auton autonomous being. Um, I am a being, I'm being, I you know that self being and becoming the whole thing. And yet, being part of this community reminds me of the roots that extend and go to. Vietnam and Germany and wherever else we are in doing this work and reading this work and becoming more of who we are, who I am individually. And it's just sobering to see the metaphor of the roots 
right here. So yeah. food for thought. Thank you, David. You know, to elaborate a little bit on that idea as well is around a tree or around a plant, a lot of times we get we witness weeds growing faster than the plant or the tr the the tree. And we witness it being surrounded and suffocated by the weeds. And so it takes a constant maintenance to pull those weeds. So that way we can allow the oxygen for the tree to have its greatest possibility of growth and bloom. And so my question for us all today is what roots are we allowing to grow within us? Are, are we allowing those weeds of doubt, of fear, of insecurity? Are we allowing those roots to really take form and suffocate the oxygen and the possibility of our lives and of our futures and of our purpose? Or are we pulling those weeds out to really allow the oxygen to come to us to really fulfill and step into our purpose of who we be and who we want to be? And I think that the, the declaration that uh, Sundance so significantly shared with us and the power of it anchoring back into who he chooses to be now, irregardless of the past and how that is now supportive, supporting him with that experience into his future. But it didn't just happen overnight. It took pulling the weeds. It takes pulling, you know, and, and if we look at a weed, uh, a root system of weeds, sometimes they grow like that as well. So what if you just pull it from the top, it keeps growing. If you just pull it from the top, it keeps growing. So sometimes we got to get in there and get really present to where that weed, what that weed or that root is that's blocking off our oxygen and not allowing us to really breathe and be who we are intended to be. And that is just so present to me right now. So thank you for allowing me share to share. And we'll have Martha share. And then I would love to come back to Sundance to see if there's one more, anything else that he would like to share before we move into the after party and last minute announcements. So Martha, thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment and presence. Mm -hmm. So what's coming forward for me through all these beautiful shares and the chapter on roots is gratitude. Immense gratitude for all of my ancestors who have struggled, who have moved through their lives in order for me to be here. And that through all that they may have gone through, through all that I have, experience as a little one has that precious innocent child that we all are that i was that i am that has formed me right where i am today that at 78 i get to just be in the gratitude that through all of that I am made to be who I am right this moment. And then in that self-forgiveness, that, that healing balm that takes place, that is self-forgiveness for myself and for all my generations. And that the roots are deep, that my roots are so deep and that through that tree that has grown through me, I have precious children who are incredible human beings and two precious six-year-old grandchildren that are blooming because of my ancestors, because of the forgiveness, because of the gratitude in which I stand. And I'm so grateful for all of the shares today they really hit me. They really touched my heart. And I've said this to you before Sundance, it's your music just sits with me. Yeah, so I'm complete. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Sundance. wanted to come back to you, come back around to you to see if there was anything else you would like to share. Um, I just thank everybody for being here today and 
having the opportunity to be able to read and be included into this group today. Um, the one thing that I was, I was listening to Martha share and as a, I realized, you know, even also listening to uh, David Block share was like, it, the, our roots of where we come up from, it's all relative to our own experience, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if someone held a gun to your head or held a paperclip to your head, it's relative to your experience. And you experienced what you experienced and no one else can have your experience. And the, the thing about roots, what roots need is mud. You know, we all, the mud is what helps us grow. And so for me, like that, I was just, I was just hearing that as Martha was speaking, you know, bamboo stays under, you can't even see bamboo come up. I think it's for like four or five years. You know, the lotus flower needs an intense amount of mud to be able to do what it does. And so um, I just feel that it, it gives us such context for who we are in life from, from where we've risen up from and, and our roots, wherever it was that we were planted it's a really beautiful thing when that sprout comes up through a crack in the sidewalk. As there's persistence and there's perseverance there. And there's a real beautiful piece that kind of comes from our nature, our, our divine wealth of nature that we are, that, that we'll, we will go up the same way that the trees reach for the sky. So thank you so much. I, I, I just appreciate being able to be here and experience all of this with you today. Thank you so much for saying yes. It has been truly an extraordinary experience for me to, as well, to be here with each and every one of you to have the opportunity to dive deeper into this, to create from here, to create through the deeper depth of understanding and even forgiveness of myself, forgiveness of my past, forgiveness of others in my past. Um, yeah, it just, I think I've read this chapter probably over 20 times and every time it's a new experience in a, a greater depth of healing and creation. So thank you all for joining us. And at this time, I would love to pass it on to our, my co-moderator, Cassie Footman. Cassie, would you like to close us out? Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And what an incredible book reading. Oh my goodness me, the phenomenal readings, the phenomenal shares. It's just been incredible. So I really want to acknowledge Sundance for your being and your presence and your incredible shares as well. And I want to acknowledge Steve, Steve Shaw for your willingness to read as well. And also the same for, Sher for Sherry, for your willingness also to read and for the shares that both Steve and Sherry have given us also. And also want to acknowledge Elaine as our moderator. Thank you so much for your presence and for your opening of this amazing reading today. And also to Tanya as our other moderator and our awesome leader here in Team Tuck for all the book readings. Thank you so much for your insights every insight that Tanya sprinkles, there's even more growth that I feel personally for me. And uh, a huge thank you to the whole Tuck team for being here and for everything that is happening behind the scenes to allow these readings to happen. And thank you to each and every one of you for showing up for your presence here, for your beautiful shares, for all the love that is being shared here as well amongst us all and for everybody also who gets to experience the richness and the depth and the beautiful roots from the recording of this reading and sharing session too. So before I just uh, very briefly introduce the next chapter that we're going to be moving on to later in the week, I just have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you on some 
events that are going to be happening. And the first one is the second anniversary of the very first Ultimate Experience event that's going to be happening in Phoenix, Arizona on the 26th and the 27th, sorry, 26th and the 27th of January of 2024. So please be aware of that and uh, keep your eyes open for any uh, further information that comes through the group with that one. We also have the ultimate experience that's happening in Birmingham here in the UK, which I personally am so excited that is going to be happening too. So uh, that's going to be happening on the 25th and 26th of May 2024. We also have as a... Uh, I guess as a reminder for those who are aware and also an introduction for those who may not be aware that we also have the Ultimate Coach YouTube channel and we've got tons and tons of content and videos on there that are definitely worth checking out if you haven't had the opportunity to visit the YouTube channel. We also have the Ultimate Coach podcast where we have had the most phenomenal interviews and we will continue to have as well. So if you haven't already had the chance to tune into and listen to the interviews in the podcast, please go and visit the podcast of The Ultimate Coach. And then finally, we also have the channel of LinkedIn too, where we have a group that is very much about bringing being into business. So for those of us, whether we run our own businesses or you're working in somebody else's business, there is so much rich sharing that's happening there. And I believe that this week on Wednesday, the 27th, they will be reading a chapter in the book and they'll be talking about how this actually relates to being in business and how you also, um, or we can, each of us, alter and adjust our own being and how we may have done that. So. If you haven't had the chance already and that speaks to you, definitely go and visit the LinkedIn group as well, which is all about bringing being into business. And so the next book reading that we have this week will take place on the 27th on Wednesday. It's going to be at 10 p.m. EDT. And the chapter we're going to be looking at is going to be chapter three. And that's a chapter growing up. And in preparation for that, for those of you who are able to come and join us or when you're watching the replay, please bring with you a picture of you growing up as well. So have that handy. And that's going to be read by our amazing guest reader, Teresa Holdaway. So I'm really, really, really looking forward to having Teresa read that for us all. So we will be moving into the after party next. And so for those of you who would love to share even deeper from what we have discussed and read about today, please do stay on. The cameras will be off and um, the recording will be stopped. So you'd be free to share deeper if you feel called to. And so now, to bring this a close, let's unmute and wish everyone a good morning, a good night, a good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. It was great. Bye, Bye. 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 Thank you, Daniel. Bye, everyone. Take thank care, you. guys. Awesome. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you, Steve. Sundance. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.